So we've looked at a lot when it comes to water quality. We've looked at the nitrogen cycle, ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, pH, general water quality issues. And in this video today, we are gonna be tackling yet another water parameter and that is water hardness, so stay tuned. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at general water hardness versus carbonate hardness. We're gonna talk about why it's important for our fish and if we wanna adjust it, we'll look at that as well. All right, so there's a couple different ways that you can measure water hardness. The first way is in degrees general hardness, degrees carbonate hardness. You'll usually recognize this because there is a number and there's a little circle in the upper right hand corner. The other way is in parts per million, which is the same thing as milligrams per liter. If you look at the back of any water hardness test kit, you'll often see both of those numbers. So there are generally five categories, and when it comes to those categories, certain fish will usually thrive in each one. So for instance, if you go from zero to three degrees hardness, which is the same thing as zero to 50 parts per million, that is considered to be very soft water. You'll often find fish from South America in those waters. The next one that you'll see is usually three degrees to six degrees, or 50 parts per million to 100 parts per million. At that point, we are still on the softer side, but a lot of our South American cichlids will be happy in those water parameters. So as we move up in the water hardness scale, then we go from six degrees to 11 degrees. Now, at that point, we're starting to get into the moderately hard water, and that's gonna be good for a lot of our live bearers, our guppies, our mollies, our platies, and even some of our goldfish at that point. And then we have between eight degrees and 12 degrees. At this point, we're dealing with hard water, somewhere in that 140 to 200 parts per million. A lot of our marine fish like that. And the last one is between 11 and 22 degrees, which is somewhere in that 200 to 400 parts per million. That's where a lot of the African cichlids really thrive. So we have our Lake Malawi cichlids, Tanganyika, Lake Victoria. They do really well in those water parameters. So now that we have that information, let's take a look at a map of the United States so we can get a really good look at what the water parameters are in certain parts of the U.S. So you this can is see a really cool website. This is the USGS.gov website. I will put a link to it in the description below. What I like about it is this map that we see right here. This is really cool because this gives us the calcium carbonate uh, concentrations in milligrams per liter or parts per million throughout the United States. And I think it provides a lot of information as to why people have success keeping certain fish in certain parts of the country. So I am in the Chicagoland area right here. And we can see here the calcium carbonate hardness. It, it's very hard between 180 and 250 milligrams per liter. And so we see all these red areas where there are there's a substantial amount of calcium carbonate hardness. And so this is an area, again, where the water hardness is fairly high. But then you look over here in parts of the West Coast, all along the uh, Southeast, except for Florida, where we have softer water. And that can help us determine, all right, what kinds of fish do we want to be keeping that are going to more closely align with our natural water parameters? And so this kind of gives us an idea of why, you know, for me, I can keep African cichlids and I have no problems and they breed and they're super happy. But maybe if you live in the Southwest, maybe in Georgia or Alabama, or you're up in the Washington State, Oregon area, you might have problems keeping African cichlids because your water is naturally softer. And this is another map that was supplied by the same website, the USGS.gov. Again, link in the description below. But take a look at this. This is alkalinity. So now we're dealing with carbonate hardness. And we can see for most of the country along the Midwest, and again, where I'm at in the Chicagoland area, the alkalinity is quite high. And we can see here above 400 in many parts of the United States. And so that is the buffering capacity of the water is actually quite good all throughout the Midwest and in parts of you know Texas and parts of the Southwest. But take a look here as we get closer to the East Coast, especially up here in the upper uh, East Coast area, the buffering capacity isn't quite as good. And as we're going to see, this can present some problems for us when we're trying to stabilize our ecosystems within our aquariums. So let's go ahead and talk about general hardness first. General hardness is a measurement of a lot of our divalent ions. And so things like calcium, things like magnesium, that's gonna really boost our general hardness. Often, calcium carbonate is a big contributor of general hardness. And if that is the case, it can also boost alkalinity, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, general hardness is important for a number of reasons. It's important for the health of our fish. And so calcium in the form of calcium carbonate can be used to build strong bones. And the divalent ions like calcium, 
like magnesium, they help fish regulate their metabolism and they help fish regulate their ion exchange. And so if calcium and magnesium are deficient in the water, fish can have health issues. One, they spend a lot of extra energy trying to manage their ion concentrations. And so that energy is being used for that instead of growth and tissue repair and the immune system. And so you generally wind up with fish that don't grow quite as well and probably aren't going to live as long. For the most part, acceptable levels of general hardness are going to be somewhere between that 60 parts per million and around 200 to 250 parts per million. Now carbonate hardness is something different. With carbonate hardness, that measurement is based on bicarbonate and carbonate that is in the water. And this has a different function. Often carbonate hardness is also referred to alkalinity. I've done a video on pH before. I'll put that card in the upper right hand corner. Alkalinity is not the same thing as pH, although often people who say that water is alkaline imply that a pH is high. It's not quite the same. What alkalinity means, it's the ability of what's in the water to buffer pH, in other words, to stabilize pH. And this is why carbonate hardness is so vital to our aquariums. If carbonate hardness is low, there's a greater likelihood that the pH will fluctuate and sometimes drastically. Generally speaking, a carbonate hardness of right around that 60 parts per million or higher is going to be good for our fish. Now, as we increase carbonate hardness, often what happens is the pH will also increase. And so you will see in a lot of the African cichlid tanks that are kept where the African cichlids are being grown successfully, there will be a high pH and a high carbonate hardness. But I think the main point here is that carbonate hardness is going to help stabilize our water parameters. When it is on the lower side, as we saw in the previous map, the water there can have more issues. So for instance, maybe it's been a while since you've done a water change. As organics build up, as nitrates build up in the water, that can actually form acids. And if your water is roughly neutral but has a low buffering capacity, you can get drastic changes in pH, which can kill and harm your fish. The other thing that can happen, as you do water changes, if the water changes are larger, and let's say your tap water is right around a pH of seven, but it has low alkalinity or low carbonate hardness, and the fish tank that you're doing maintenance on, maybe that pH has, has gotten a little bit lower because there's no buffering capacity with all the organics that have built up. Maybe that's right around a six, and all of a sudden you do that 50% water change, and your pH starts to go up and then starts to drop, and every week that's happening, that can stress out fish considerably. So what can we do to alter the general hardness or carbonate hardness of our fish tanks? I said this when I did the pH video, but we wanna be very, very careful about altering the water chemistry of our fish tanks. For the most part, a stable pH, stable water hardness is going to be better than trying to achieve some optimal level. We need to also understand that as we adjust water hardness, especially carbonate hardness, it is going to impact other water quality factors such as pH. They all work together. When it comes to general hardness, that's probably the easier of the two to safely adjust. Many people will add crushed coral to their fish tanks. In fact, we have crushed coral in some of ours. It really doesn't adjust our pH or water hardness at all because our water hardness is already fairly hard and our pH is high coming out of the tap. Crushed coral will have some impact on carbonate hardness and it will have some impact on general hardness. And in doing so, it can also raise the pH. Crushed coral works better if it's in a filter bag, in a filter, rather than just part of the substrate, but either way, it will impact both water hardness and pH. Again, the, the extent to which it impacts those water parameters is really gonna depend on your starting point. If you've naturally got a very low pH and very, very little alkalinity, it's probably gonna impact that environment more than if you're over a pH of seven already and water hardness is already relatively high. It's one of the reasons why when we did the low boy on the other side, we're keeping a pistogramma species in that tank, which is a South American cichlid. But we used an African cichlid mix that generally buffers the pH right around an eight or an 8.2 and has some water hardening capabilities. I didn't really worry about it, why? Because our water is naturally that way anyway. So it really didn't have any impact on our water parameters. Some people also use limestone to adjust their water hardness, both general hardness and carbonate hardness. But again, anytime you're doing this, I would caution you to, you to be very, very careful. And it would be more beneficial to add smaller amounts initially just to see how your ecosystem is responding to these changes. Another popular method for adjusting water hardness is using sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. 
Again, we have to be very careful here because a small amount of baking soda can have a major impact on your ecosystem. And finally, there are commercially available chemicals from all of our big manufacturers in the aquatics hobby that will help boost pH or help lower pH or help buffer fish tanks. Once again, we have to be very careful. If you have a relatively stable pH based on your water parameters, based on your maintenance, and your water hardness is sufficient, be very careful when using these chemicals because wild fluctuations in water hardness, especially carbonate hardness, can have drastic impacts on pH. Now, what if we want a lower pH? In my mind, this is a more difficult thing to do correctly. And there are methods in which that it can be done. So the first is adding peat. A lot of people add peat moss to the back of a filter and let that run. Often what's best is to take that peat and remove the extracts and then add that to a fish tank. The other thing that people do is add RO water. RO water can lower pH and will also lower water hardness. The one thing I would caution you against, uh, some people will use dehumidifier water. We have a dehumidifier that runs in our fish room and that water not only does it have no water hardness, it's got no alkalinity, and yes, it's going to lower pH, but that is a really good way if you use too much to kill a lot of fish because you are removing, not only are you lowering pH, but you are removing a lot of the buffering capacity and you could wind up with wild fluctuations in your pH which can kill a lot of fish. All right, so what about things like driftwood, catapa leaves, choya wood? You may have heard that these things will lead to a reduction in pH by releasing tannic acids. And I think one of the reasons why we get differences of opinion when it comes to how well those things work really has its roots in KH. Remember, KH, carbonate hardness, is the ability of water to resist changes in pH. So if someone has a low KH, if you add driftwood, if you add catapolis, if you add the choya wood, that will release tannic acids and will probably impact pH much more than somebody who has a high KH, or in other words, a high buffering capacity that resists those changes in pH. So adding the driftwood, adding the catapa leaves, that may impact your pH if your KH is already lower. Remember, even so-called soft water fish are still going to need divalent ions in the water to help maintain their ion concentrations. It's not going to be as high, but we need to be very careful there. All right, everybody, so I hope you found that useful. If you did, check out some of the other videos on our water quality parameters. I will put cards at the end of this video so you can check those out. If you like this video, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.